And speaking of not thinking, let's roll into our next topic, the story of Pokemon <laughs> Sword and Shield. <laughs> All right, what's up, everybody? It's your boy Shaheener coming back at you with another episode of the Pokemon Babblers podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Bonner916. Hello. And so just because there hasn't really been much of an update on the Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, we are actually going to be going back on each episode from Generation 8 all the way back to Generation 1. And so for this first episode over here, we're actually going to be talking about Pokemon Sword and Pokemon Shield. So, Bono, if you want to give us a, a quick introduction on the Generation 8 games. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be going, uh, covering a lot of the gener uh, stuff that happens in each generation going backwards just to, you know, give ourselves some more content to work with. You know, obviously, as we wait for more news for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. And so we figured a good starting point would be games that have been, you know, released more modern, and we can go from there and give our opinions and stuff on that. So starting with our first topic on Pokemon Sword and Shield, we're going to go over the starters for Gen 8, which would be Grookey, uh, Scorbunny, and Sobble. Yes, let me pull a picture of them, because I actually didn't have that in my... Uh... Well, that's fine. I was going to say, we could do, uh, we talk about it earlier. We were talking about it before we started, about how, I was like, I tried to watch the reveal trailer for Sword and Shield. I was like, I honestly don't remember where I was when the Gen 8 trailer was revealed. I remember where I was for the Gen 9 one perfectly, but for Gen 8, it's kind of hazy. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure we were in a call. Uh, it was uh, Pokemon Day, mm -hmm. and we were just on a call together watching it as it was happening live. It's and happening! Yeah, it's happening. I think it's been every game reveal since X and Y, I believe, we just watched together. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know about X and Y, because X and Y was like 6 a.m., and that was the first apartment. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we woke up early. I know we've woken up early at 6 a.m. multiple times for these reveals. Uh, maybe Gen 7 and onwards. But mm. Gen 6, I remember just like being in my living room in the first apartment mm -hmm. and watching it. And then I was like, oh my god, X and Y, yay. And then went back to bed. Mm -hmm. We got mm -hmm. Grookey on the right, then Scorbunny in the middle, Sobble on the left. I don't know. So much like any Pokemon journey, we start with the starters. So what were what were your initial thoughts when they revealed the, th the starters for Gen 8? I was Grookey gang day one. I was, out the, day one. I was out the gate Grookey gang. For me, mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, I like Grookey, not only because it's a monkey, but also I just like the design a little bit more than the other ones. I feel like, I don't know, I never cared for Scorbunny and Sobble was kind of just whatever. Grookey was just, I just gravitated I towards it because I didn't care for the others. I can see, because we talked about it in the last episode where like the beginning forms are like so good, but like <laughs> what they turn into is what overall determines like how much you like it. For me, I initially liked Scorbunny, but I had the feeling that like, you know, I had my reservations like, oh, what's it going to turn into? For all of these, they look really good. I enjoy Sobble's artwork. I don't mm -hmm. enjoy it much like in the game because I don't, I I don't think I actually used it. I think the only two I actually used were Grookey and Scorbunny. Initially, when I saw them, I was like, okay, that's cool, because you see the trailer footage, and you see uh, Scorbunny, I believe, first, like, running around, leaving fire wherever it goes. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then after that, Sobble shows up out of the water, showing its, like, chameleon lizard stuff, puts out the fire. And then at the very end, you get Grookey, you know, doing the Grookey thing, tapping on a rock, dr driven up a beat, and um, then, then they're just like, bam, in your face, the starters. So initially... Uh, I really like Scorbunny's design. I like the white rabbit and, you know, like the, the various colors going towards or, uh, red or, or red orange at the top. And so I was initially uh, Team Scorbunny. Sobble came on and then I was like, eh. And then Grookey was there and I was like, oh, okay, Grookey's pretty cool too. So it was really a toss up between those two for me. Yeah, because the first game that I got, I my first playthrough was on Sword and I used Grookey as my starter. But then mm -hmm. after that, I did a playthrough of Pokemon Shield on stream. You can check that out at twitch.tv slash Shaheener. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so then I asked I asked the viewers or friends or whoever was there which starter I should use, and they told me to do a dice roll. It's like 1 to 3 would be Grookey, 4 to 6 would be Scorbunny, and then 7 to 9 would be Sobble. That's and a I, Bono original idea right there. Yeah, exactly. I'm pretty sure that you were the one that recommended it. It's either you or Patrick, but... Mm -hmm. uh, the role ended up being for Scorbunny, which I was just like, okay, I haven't used a fire starter in a while in my first playthrough or anything like that. So I just went with Scorbunny and it was fine for what it's worth. Like while I was playing through the game, I guess I was just indifferent on if I was going to choose Scorbunny or Ensemble. And I didn't want to use Grookey again. So that way I could have more of a diverse team. Yeah. And then what they all turned into generally, I just, it was, it, they were kind of like whatever Pokemon for me, like Inteleon's okay. Uh, Cinderace is okay. I'd say like, the only one that's like above okay you know like above a medium is probably rillaboom yeah oh rillaboom was amazing i rillaboom love... but what? like the middle forms 
are just completely forgettable. Oh yeah, they're trash. They're all trash. Yeah, the mid forms are all garbage. And then if I were to rank my favorite of the final starter or the final evolutions of the starters would be Rillaboom, then Cinderace, and then uh, Inteleon. I didn't That's care for in Inteleon one, two, three, four, right? Yeah, yeah. So from okay. my favorite to my least favorite. Yeah, I did okay. not care for Inteleon. I did like Cinderace, or at least I grew to like Cinderace. I don't know if it's because I mm-hmm. used it on the team, but I don't know. It's just more enjoyable. And it seemed more of a natural step from Scorbunny to Cinderace. I feel like Rabbit was just really just awkward. I think Cinderace is really like the only one that fits for, you know, the Galar region, Galar region being a region based off the UK. I can't imagine they have like a chameleon and a monkey running around. But a lot of people were like, oh, no, it's like Charles. It's like Darwinism. So like the monkey and like the lizard are like supposed to be representations of that. But I feel like that's a stretch. And I feel like they were really just like lost as to what the other two starters were going to be. So they just like picked two two designs from a hat. Yeah, it's like they wanted to rationalize it to themselves of, like, why it makes sense in the world. But there's a lot of things that don't make sense in the Pokemon world that exist. Like, I That's mean, we'll true. be getting to it in Generation 6, but look at, like, a Pokemon like, like Klefki. Or true. if you go over to Generation 1 when you have Machoke having a belt. Like, how does it grow a belt in the wild? Like, there are things mm-hmm. like that that just don't make sense, so... It's like I'm not I'm trying my best not to question stuff like that anymore. See, just... now now that I'm thinking about it, imagine if we got Score Bunny, but if we replaced Sobble and Grookey with Sprigatito and Quaxley for generation eight. Like if they because you know, if we're if we're going off of what I was saying, like animals that would exist in the UK, a cat and a duck aren't that far off. Right. So imagine if they had those in Gen 8 instead of mm. or those in Gen 8 instead of Gen 9. That'd be... And it would make a lot more sense. I could see that. Right. I mean Granted, I can't imagine how Sobble and Grookey would work in Generation 9 in the new region, but I could totally True. see the the other two, the Sprigatito and Quaxley, going into Generation 8. That would make a lot more sense. Right. Well, I mean, especially right. because I believe that all the swans in the UK are owned by the royal family. Mm-hmm. And so having some sort of, like, waterfowl would make sense. Mm. Uh, I, just cha- I just changed up the whole game for you. I just yeah. changed it all up. Yeah, you made me think, and I don't like thinking. <laughs> Right. And speaking of not thinking, let's roll into our next topic, the story of Pokemon <laughs> Sword and Shield. <laughs> because um, one could, there's two sides of this coin, and generally they end up in the same direction. One could say that the story makes no sense and has no bearing, and that, you know, it's just, it's forgettable. Because, let's be honest, it really is. The very basic outline of this story that they went with is that you travel, you become friends with your neighbor who just, brothers just so happens to be champion. You get sponsored to cha- to start the gym challenge. And then from there, you travel to throughout the region of Galar, challenging the eight gym leaders, collecting their badges. And then from there, once you collect all eight badges, you enter the finals, which also has the, which is to determine the champion. And I guess, if I remember correctly, all eight gym leaders are seated into that tournament. Because uh, I believe you do yeah. you do battle the gym leaders again. Yeah, because it felt more of like, like a sporting tournament. Like, it really felt like that it was like a sport in the, right. in the region rather than, okay, you go to these gyms and you go to a competition. It just felt like an actual, like, uh, like, like a soccer event. And I think that they really right. tried to emphasize it like that because it's based in the UK that they try to make it more like, like football. And then the O. Henry twist to the story is that uh, they try to jam some sort of like natural like environment. End of the world plot. And, well, end of the world, but also like a, what do you call it? Like an over-dependence on a certain non-renewable resource mm. with, uh, was it Wishing Stars? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I believe yeah. so. And, like, they somehow try to, like, combine that plot with, like, you know, the energy crisis. And the and if, if I'm remembering the story as much as I can correctly, they're saying that because they're using wishing stars at such a rate that Dynamaxing will become unstable or something like that in 10,000 years. And so the whole point of the, the story is that, like, the chairman gets all up in arms about it because he's so enraptured with Dynamaxing that he wants to preserve Dynamaxing at all costs. Or if it, if another way they're saying, if they tie it to like power, that in 10,000 years, all the power in Galar will be used up because they're consuming it at such a rate right now. Mm-hmm. And ultimately this, this oh Henry dark twist goes nowhere. Because a 10 year old child could save the day. Right. Which isn't anything new, but at least with like sun and moon, it had like some bearing on the story. It didn't have like a, 
it doesn't come out of nowhere like it does in this game because this this whole dark plot comes out of nowhere yeah there is no evil team (laughs) i mean his intentions were good at first for rose wanting to provide sustainable energy for the region but he was he got too greedy and he got too up his own ass about what he actually wanted i don't know he tried to take advantage of eternatus the point we're getting at here is the story is very like un is like very convoluted like we went from a simple plot like the actual like yeah it was like the conflict was shoehorned for sure yeah the conflict to this journey was definitely shoehorned in the you know if you go you do the basic hero's journey thing the original you know reiteration we had with the with the gym challenge had no conflict you just went through the eight gyms and stuff like that and then they shoehorned in this like energy crisis subplot that ultimately went nowhere so in my dream (laughs) version for this game or fixing it i would hope that they'd focus more on the gym challenges instead of shoehorning in that energy plot because Mm -hmm. like imagine have you ever had a dream that that you um you had to put more emphasis on your rival characters like bead and hop and marnie instead of you know shoehorning in like the darkest day and stuff like that at certain key moments of the story and they gave more time to the other three rival characters yeah i guess i would bring it more to like like generation one when your main like your main enemy i mean other than team rocket was your rival it was right. blue with this one it seemed like that they have a feeling just because the games were more of a budget and it's now on a main console that they wanted to just turn the story up to 11 and just make it as grandiose as possible but right. it doesn't seem because like, ultimately yeah. We haven't had a good story since Black and White. Yeah, Black and like, White. We haven't had yeah. a compelling story since then. Yeah, like I said in the last episode, Black and White, I feel like, was the last game that they actually put any real care into. That everything mm. else just kind of been put out just to put out a Pokemon game. I feel like the plot was just kind of, like, forced on this one, where they're just trying to be like, oh, yeah, it's the, the big thing, so we gotta make mm-hmm. all, like, raise all the stakes and do right. all this and that. But it, it just seemed really forced. But if they Ultimately, didn't, it would just be like yeah. the original games where you just go through the gym challenge and there's not really like anything to write home about. Yeah, I think that if if we cut out the whole uh, Rose subplot, I feel like the simpler it would have been better. Not in the sense that like it would have been like, oh my god, like remember this game. It just the story aspect of it wouldn't be ripped ripped on so hard if Mm -hmm. it would just kept it simple i feel like they probably had it and then they felt that it was too simple and that people would complain so then they shoehorned that in to get where they wanted to go i guess i feel like simplicity kind of gets lost these days with video games that sometimes having like minimal plot or minimal whatever sometimes goes a long way i mean not to say that like you should put minimal effort into it but right it's also like the minimum amount of like tools at your disposal could work or like minimal amount of uh like the kirby games yeah Exactly. Like with Kirby games, there's never like some huge. Well, so, okay, some of okay, there's some of them there are huge world-ending events going on, but yeah. like the simple journey of getting there is you know just Kirby running through a level. Yeah, you're not you don't have that in the back of your mind the whole time that you're there. You're just like okay, you're just playing a level by level. But mm-hmm. then at the end, they really try to force the plot more. Like I feel like that's how it's been with the last few Kirby games. We're going on that side tangent where they just kind of also again shoehorn it in like right at the end. Mm-hmm. But for most of the game, you're not thinking about it. And almost, I right. guess in a way that does parallel with Sword and Shields, like you're not thinking about it until like right at the end. Right. Where... You never think about the energy crisis until they bring it up again. <laughs> I feel like they really should have focused more on the gym challenge as a whole. Like I said, developing your rivals and then creating situations where in cities where you're, you being a gym challenger actually matters. Like say like, you know how Marnie has team yell. Like what if you had your own team? Or, like, your own developing, like, cheerleading squad or something like that. And you see people that are waving, like, the towels that have the number that you pick. Because ultimately you do pick a number yeah. to go on your jersey and stuff like that. Yeah, because nobody's and rooting you... for you. Yeah, no one's really rooting for you they aside from it. your they own mother. <laughs> right? Yeah. So imagine if, like, you had your car- your rival developments and, you know, your their um, rival factions plus your own developing faction and stuff like that Before. i feel like if they they like like you could have marnie and beat or whatever but and like you end up picking hop and then they could tie that with version exclusivity so let's say you pick sword and we could do it the thing that like hop has like a family crest or whatever and a family heirloom of the rusted shield and stuff like that and so like they could do like the background thing with sonia still where they like oh like in ancient times there was a two clans that or two kings that fought each other all the time and like when they fought each other like great pokemon would come come from that and stuff like that so you guys could be like from rival factions or whatever or your team could like gift you the rusted sword 
and they could be a roundabout way of how you would get the sort you know the version exclusives yeah that'd be really cool especially like if you have like multiple games but you could choose which mm -hmm. main legendary you get based off of the items that you pick and the factions that you're in and that i would say be. like the story shouldn't be like i you know obviously it could be rewritten from the ground up but i feel like with working with what we have and definitely abandoning the energy crisis subplot because that goes absolutely nowhere and and no time at all i think it, like if you focus more on the gym challenge you could have had a better story yeah. overall i'd say the story for this one definitely like four out of ten to yeah. be honest yeah, I'd probably say somewhere around there, like a four or three. It's just, yeah, like we said before, Gen 5 was like, it was a good plot in that one, especially in Black and White 2. Mm -hmm. And everything after that just, it seems to get campier and campier since Gen 6. Like since then, they've kind of done like the break the fourth wall, very self-aware like, especially, like, in Gen 6 with Team Flare. They're mm. very much just, like, a generic supervillain movie kind of thing. Well, and we'll get more into that when we get to the Gen 6 episode, because yeah. Gen X and Y are, are a whole yeah. topic under themselves, poor, yeah. poor things. Mm -hmm. But uh, moving on from there, we'll go ahead and talk about what we thought about, like, the character models and, like, mm -hmm. the uh, actual, like, NPCs of the game. Mm -hmm. And I actually think they really nailed it in on this on in sword and shield you know as we go well not the protagonist just the character models themselves yeah. of like everyone in the game because you give you we made the jump from 2d to 3d in gen 6 right and in gen 6 we got your little stubby little 3d characters and in gen 7 they looked a little bit better but for whatever reason they felt they felt like too tall and lanky as as like you know for the world they were in i don't know like if, if the buildings were bigger or something like that and put them more into perspective it'd be better i just feel like they're too disproportionate for what they're supposed to be but in sword and shield i feel like they it's perfect yeah. i feel like they, they've nailed the size and like the scope of like every person in the game i loved every uh npc trainer model i never felt like any of them were like oh my god what am i looking at mm -hmm. and you know i always felt like your character model running around was great you know one thing i do have criticisms about is um the male backpack i absolutely hate oh yeah that thing is the like male a backpack. suitcase on the back like look how big yeah. it is on on the protagonist over here right like, and then if you get like some b-roll footage of like just him walking around that's stupid like you know it's, it's just so ugly obtuse. That's why, like, I mean, I use the the male protagonist in Sword, mm -hmm. but on Shield, I use a female one because the backpack doesn't look too crazy, and there's mm -hmm. way more customizing options, I feel like. Which also, that's something I was going to bring up, too, mm -hmm. speaking of, like, character designs. The customizing mm -hmm. option for clothes was really good in this game. I mm -hmm. mean, granted, the thing that was probably frustrating the most is that every color of a certain accessory you had to pay for separately like, altogether. Right. And I feel like that they could have changed it by doing like a palette swap of like the colors and whatnot. But mm -hmm. like the character designs were great. The customizing was great. And all the NPCs were awesome, too, except for Swordward and Shieldbert. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, like Marnie. Yeah, I would say and, those are the only two yeah. I hate. Yeah. But everyone else, I feel like is really good. Yeah. God, Swordward and Shieldbert were just those were just They're mistakes. Terrible. Those are Very some bad. of the worst things I've ever seen. But everything else was just on point. I mean, granted, the protagonists do look like they're way, like, older than 10. Yeah, that's but... another thing. Is like, they look really old mm -hmm. <laughs> compared to what we've usually had. And like you said, like I think we said in the last episode when we were talking about, like, uh, the, the general market for Pokemon games. I don't know. I, obviously, I can't rewind time. But I can't tell. I can't. I wouldn't know what, like a six-year-old would feel like playing as you know these kids that look like they're 16 or 17 you know doing stuff like that i don't i don't know yeah. whether i'd be feel great or whether i'd feel cheated so yeah i mean so, i mean i remember when i was a kindergartner i was like like five or so mm -hmm. and we had this like the system where we'd have the sixth graders would teach us like or like show us books and like read to mm -hmm. us and things like that and I remember thinking that they were like, they were so, they seem so old. Like they seem so grown up. Granted, they're only like, like 12 or mm -hmm. so, but they seem like that they're like full on grown ups just compared to how small we were. And so maybe that's kind of how this is too, where it's like, if you are like a younger kid and you see like, whoa, the 10 years old, they're so, they're so put together. They're so mm -hmm. like grown up. Like they have leather shoes and they have backpacks that go over their whole back. And so I like their, their, their proportions look all good to me yeah. but what i would say is that every like character that has a name is very distinct from the other like yeah. you can clearly remember what each uh person like looks like and what they denote especially mm -hmm. the gym leaders like milo there's yeah. no get there's no confusing Dude's milo with somebody else jacked. Dude's fucking Boy's stacked. jacked the card that eludes me but nessa the nessa card oh Bless, Good, you know. Bless thank you, Ness. Nintendo. Nintendo knows what sells these games these days. <laughs> and then you get uh, the third gym leader, 
I'm trying to remember his name. I just talked about how they're un- they're unforgettable, but he's the old fire guy. Like you, I I wouldn't forget that. Uh oh shit, what was his name? I don't remember. Uh, but moving on, then you got the fourth gym leader with the split between Alistair and B, and then you get the fifth gym leader Opal. Yeah, that was a new thing too, where it's like they split the they yeah. split the gyms, which was really cool. To I really like how they have the how... Nessa one on the far right. Oh oh. Pfft. But, that's a yeah. fan art yeah but um but you get it like each yeah. gym leader is distinct in their uh, in their design and so then moving on we have the oh, wait. oh I think we have there's the split. some fakes in here too this is kind of yeah that's the front row and so you have um oh kabu that's his name yeah, kabu, kabu, just kidding. Then, kabu well uh, and then opal gordy and then is the gordy the and melanie and mm-hmm. then piers the i would say yeah. if anybody was the most forgettable one it's yeah. him Piers, because his uh his I his town okay. doesn't have a stadium yeah yeah and also he very much didn't believe in the whole uh dynamax situation too dynamax like when you battle him, it was just a straight up just street fight All right and then raihan who actually yeah. has probably one of the most memorable gym battles because it's a dumbbell battle yeah and also he's a total beta male when it comes to uh leon <laughs> yeah like, i've always lost leon and i'm jealous and this right and, that. and then, like, you know, going off of that our champion leon uh has a very distinct cape and his hat and i think he has like a hat collection in his room yeah and then his pose so, you know, a lot of the character designs, like, were really distinct and really out there. And I think that's something that's missing with some of the other Pokemon games because... Uh, kind of just battle and forget, but these guys have their own personality, yeah. too. Like, you like right. you talk with them more often, especially as we get talking about, the, like, the DLC later on. But, uh, right. yeah, like, they're really distinct. Like, you could tell they're, like, they're not just the gym leader. They're characters. Right. And then I feel like if we go back to our story thing and we make it so that like each gym leader has like, you know, obviously they live in their own town and they're supported by their own fans. But if you had like um, trainers that were like sporting their gear, like, it, well, I mean, the gym trainers are sporting the uniforms. But like if you had like people in the town that had like Milo's hat or whatever, or, you know, had like uh, the armband for Nessa and stuff like that, you like you see a lot more like fans. You feel a lot more immersed in the world that th- mm-hmm. these people are very respected for what they do and how they do it. Yeah, and they have their own fans too in their stadiums. Right. And so it's like you could tell like they built that following, and you kind of want to be like, I want to have that following for myself. Right. And- Maybe fill the 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 stadium because you do get the stadium shots of like the trainer of uh, people that are watching. Fill them with uh, grass type Pokemon for Milo's place, mm-hmm. or fighting type Pokemon for Bee's gym, just to show that you know like there's a following there. Like they they're not just there for them, but they believe in like the typing and all that stuff. Especially with Rose, Rose is also a distinct character. Mm-hmm. Opal as well, Bead, Marnie, uh, Hop. I guess. I mean, Hop. I can only remember Hop because he shows up all the damn time. But yeah, you had like like the Team Yell characters, which honestly, Team Yell wasn't even like a a villainous group. They're just Mm-mm. they're just fans of Marnie, which I mean. Great. I think you battle all... them. Yeah. I think you battle them like a sum total of three times. Yeah, you really don't bother with them all too much. And then moving on to our last uh, people to talk about, uh, Professor Magnolia and Professor Sonia. Mm-hmm. At the end of the at the end of the game, there's spoiler alert for those who haven't beaten the Sword and Shield storyline. Yeah, there was really a lack of a professor for this generation. I mean, she mm-hmm. gives you the Pokedex, granted, but yeah. you never see she her never, again. She was never like one that was good to care like you could tell that she's kind of like on her way out to like retire and stuff right and so imagine like if like sonia and magnolia started rooting for you towards the end or maybe sonia roots for leon because she's leon's friend and magnolia shows up with like a little a little flag that has your number on it or something like that mm-hmm. like that would give them a lot more meaning or maybe she checks up on you throughout the uh, journey and stuff, or a co- like with Rose and stuff like that, because she really feels like a, a one-off character. I really yeah. don't feel like there's a lot of ca- like you know she wasn't given a time time to shine. Everybody, I feel like was not like a hundred percent realized, but they mm. definitely had more use and purpose than Professor Magnolia. It just seemed like Professor Magnolia was there just for like one scene to like talk about something but then sonia really took the reins after that not just as like the professor but as a supporting character right and if they really want to double down on her becoming a professor they could have just paired her up with magnolia and had scenes where magnolia is being respected or educating people and then you could show sonia kind of getting like you know she's envious that her grandmother is such a well-respected uh person in her field oh yeah i forgot that that was a thing that 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 she was the the granddaughter of Professor yeah Lee. and you I could show that, that. The, her general build up to be, becoming her own person and becoming her own uh established uh professor so i feel like there was a lot of missed potential for the characters in this game because you know like we said they're so distinct 
and you can you know like if they were given just a little bit more time this you know you would have you could have been you would have people online all the time being like oh my god i love the story development for milo i love the Mm -hmm. this and that for this person you'd get everyone saying oh that was my favorite gym leader Mm -hmm. and if they were they showed it like in the anime i'd be rooting for you know this gym leader yeah but then you get the people that are like, why didn't they give enough time to uh, to this gym leader? Why did they just, like, mm-hmm. shove him to the side? Yeah, you'd have people very passionate this way and that. Yeah, but I feel like, you know, that's just another thing that they failed to realize that could have made this game a lot better than we ended up getting. So mm-hmm. overall, for, like, character model design, I'd say a 9 out of 10. Yeah, I'd probably say, like, an 8 to 9. 8 to a 9? Yeah. Okay, yeah, Absolutely. I can see it. I, like, you know, there there are some that, like, stand out that I'm like, oh my god, I love it. But there are also some where I'm like, oh, okay, it's not that Take great. Mm-hmm. Take it or leave it. But yeah, yeah I really enjoy every single uh, person's yeah. design. Don't mm-hmm. enjoy their, their their personality, but definitely their design. Yeah, absolutely. And so speaking of design, let's move on to the actual design of the games themselves, including the routes and the mm-hmm. cities and lastly, the wild area. Yes. So, so the routes are very short. Yes, and very linear very and very short. Boring. It feels like it's just a way so they don't have to make it like a total open world game. They just give you these little small passageways to get you from city to city. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like that they just kind of just threw those in. But the mm-hmm. big thing I feel like was the wild area. I don't know how you feel sure. about it, but that's how I feel. I, yeah, I, 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 I want to get to the wild area last just yeah. so we can blow through the, the routes yeah. and stuff like that. You know, each city... Like I said in the last video, I think we went over it, we were talking about like the open worldness cities for the next for Scarlet and Violet. I feel like each city was, is only there to serve a purpose of being, you know, a gym mm-hmm. or being a story location. There yeah. are no places that are just like you know towns that you go to to like fill out the world. Each city there serves a purpose, and that's it. Like mm-hmm. that's that's their one reason for existence. Yeah, is to house a gym or to house a story mm-hmm. event because. Yeah. Uh, what's it Winden has the final battle plus the final uh the championship and then besides that every other town i believe is a gym battle that's not the beginning town or the town right next the the, the town right next to it each each route is just a linear path just to get to the next area just to get to the next area and like the only one that i could remember that has that like was like really like stand out to me and was like wow was the uh glimwood tangle Oh yeah, that one was really cool. Which yeah. they had that weird forty-minute um, nature documentary thing mm-hmm. before the games came out, and people stood there watching the damn thing for like a couple yeah. of minutes just to get the uh, the yeah. Galler pony taw at mm-hmm. the end. Yep, and that and that was worth it. It was worth that every was a we- that was a weird marketing decision. Yeah, that was super. Speaking of weird marketing decisions around that time, I remember when uh, Detective Pikachu the movie was coming out, and they mm-hmm. had that like hour and a half long video of just like detective pikachu dancing because mm-hmm. it's like oh the movie leaked but it's just that it was just him dancing the whole time it's just what right. like weird and wild right another area i would like say is kind of cool was like the um like the cliff sides going up towards the fourth gym with b and alistair and they have that giant doug trio statue I don't know why, <laughs> yeah. but it was, that was cool. Yeah, I remember um, the, the area with the mines were kind of cool, like, earlier in the game. Like, I think it was on your way to Turfield. Yeah, uh, the forget. Galar Mines. Yeah, the Galar Mines are pretty cool. There's two of them. There's one from Turfield, and then there's one coming from um, the second gym to the third gym, going yeah. back around. Yeah, And it was weird, because it was just Galar Mine number one and Galar Mine number two. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, Galar Mine number one, I thought, was a little bit cooler than two. But and I think, two. yeah, because two also host, hosted one of the worst, uh, worst Pokemon in existence. Galar uh, Stun- Galar Stun- Fuck you. <laughs> Galar Stunfisk. Galar Stunfisk, yeah. And, um, but yeah, other than that, like a lot of the, I would say the towns are nice. Because mm-hmm. I do, like, you know, they, they, like I said, they serve their one purpose, but like they have like a bunch of like sub stuff you can do, like talk to people to get items like you usually do. But they're a lot more hidden, and the design-wise, they're pretty cool. Motostoke is pretty cool with the giant wheel, mm-hmm. and then also having like the canal area and stuff like that with all the brick-laid buildings. And um, Churchester is pretty cool. It's like the Snowden city with that big foot bath for whatever right. reason. Yeah. The the public bath. The uh, Opal's Town. I know it's Glenwood Tangle. I just don't know what the name is. I feel like that could have been explored more. Um, what else? Oh, inside is where the fourth gym is. I don't know why it has like such a 
like a deserty feel to it <laughs> even though it's like you know when you think of the uk you definitely don't think of a desert yeah it's uh Ballinley was the city Ballinley. yeah i mean you go through like a plethora of like weather zones you go from a forest to a ice place to a desert mm -hmm. you know and then next to the coast i don't know i feel like when they do stuff like that and that we'll get to that in the wild area thing like the weather the rapidly changing like biomes yeah are like too much yeah. Like, right it's it's too much i feel like start simple and then you start adding stuff onto it from there but you got to keep things more simple than you would drastically change things like that yeah. but other than that i would say the towns and the routes are probably like a five out of ten not really that great not really yeah. that memorable yeah Boundly, i think was the only one that really stood out honestly that mm -hmm. just felt like wow this is unique or at least unique for pokemon the just, mushrooms and like it being like just so it just feels like, like a fairy tale no hidden in the forest right yeah. yeah there were only let's see two and then there's eight gyms and then there's ten. i think like what there's 10 maybe 11 cities in the game yeah they could have given more more stuff i feel like you know maybe if this game had another year to cook and develop it, it could have been better yeah or it could have been more more than what it is but for what we have and what we got it wasn't you know super over the top i'd say like a five out of ten for sure yeah i'd probably have to agree roughly around there like i'd probably say like five I mean, I can't really, okay. like, I don't hate it or love it. It's just kind of in the middle. And going from there, we'll move into what at what they probably sunk the most time into was the wild area. The the newest addition to the Gen 8 games and what was probably the one thing they worked on more than anything else in this game was implementing the wild area, which is an open zone in the game that's situated between the second town in the game and the third town and encompasses most of the game's mass. It's just a giant air as they say wild area that's filled to the brim with uh, pokemon of all types in different biomes and yeah so what do, what do you what do you what are your thoughts on the wild area and I, how would you exp go about it i feel like the wild area when first experiencing it because i remember when the game came out i didn't buy it right away we'll get into the topic a little bit later or kind of like we'll talk about it but um yeah so i remember i was over at your place and mm -hmm. you're playing and when you guys first got to the wild area because i didn't look at any footage really of the mm -hmm. game except for like maybe like one or two like of the beginning trailers and i was mm -hmm. like wow this is like they're really trying to take it to the next level with this one granted visually a lot of stuff looks like just straight dukas like it just mm -hmm. looks like just poop but it's just so cool of how open it is and compared to how they worked on it in Legends that this really seemed to set the groundwork for what they're going to be doing for future games until the next mm -hmm. big thing to not like revolutionize, but just take that over, take this format over. Because right. what this is, I like the wild area quite a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like how everything was set up with it. But I do feel like that they could have fleshed it out more, like having like trainers in it. Like, I mean, they had some challenges, but like the, it was just mainly just running around. Right. And like you said, I feel like this was a, was like a testing bed for what would they do going forward with the Pokemon series in, in general? And um, like you said, there's varying biomes, which really make no sense because you go from one end to the other and it goes from a forest to a desert. Or in, you know, then they have the random weather effects, whether it's foggy or stuff like that or, mm -hmm. or, or sunny. And sometimes the three worst ones, I believe, are the, the fog, the mist and the snow because yeah. you can't see anything going around forever. Yeah. And also some of the Pokemon only show up in certain weather conditions as well. Right. Because there are these new things they implemented called dens which mm -hmm. they're like rock formations they could go to where you could have a special like a specific battle like a uh it's basically a specific pokemon battle and depending on the weather conditions and depending on what kind of light is being emitted from the den you could get an exclusive pokemon or really rare pokemon or uh some right kind of Kinda... yeah Kind of harkening back to like the hidden grottos from Gen 5, except, you know, you're guaranteed a Pokemon here. But like each battle in there is against a Dynamax Pokemon, which is the new the newest gimmick of this generation where each Pokemon grows in size and gets access to basically um, Z moves, mm -hmm. basically. And then you and a team of four, you, in you included with three other trainers, fight against this Dynamax Pokemon and battle it. And if you win, you can have the chance to catch it. And it could run away, or you can catch it. And then and after that, you also get uh, items for a lot being of perks. The, yeah, you get a lot of perks for doing the dens, mm -hmm. which is another thing we'll get on into yeah. later. Yeah. But um, overall, going through the wild area and trying to catch Pokemon, what are your impressions of that? It really broke the game. I feel like with the dens. 
Well, I that's yeah. what I was saying. We'll get to oh. that later. But oh. like going going around like the main wild area and like getting on your bike and like driving around and like running and catching into Pokemon. What were your thoughts on that? I feel like the I feel like the wild area is way too big with not enough checkpoints. Is that mm-hmm. there's only like three or four checkpoints in the whole wild area. So it's like if you wanted to go to a specific area, you have to like go from like if you're at the beginning of the wild area and you want to get to like the nursery. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, that's a quick one, but what if you wanted to go, like, in between that, if you wanted to go to, like, the bogs, or if you wanted to go to, what is it, the place with, like, the evolutions and stuff, you have to make this huge trek all the way over there, when they should have added some more checkpoints where you could fly to, instead of just, like, wheeling. Because you do, you do, at least when you start and you get there, you have access to most of the wild area, like, you, bar being getting into battles with high level pokemon you can run throughout most of the entire wild area i believe the only uh, like so you know soft checkpoint you have to do is get to i believe going towards the eighth gym which is piers and yeah. getting the uh right. getting the water bike no the eighth gym is raihan or seventh gym yeah piers is the yeah is is after the churchester battle mm-hmm. You have to cross water, and then I, that's, I believe, when they give you the Rotom bike upgrade with the water bike. Right. And then from there, you have full access to the uh, wild area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I would say, like, going through it is, it, like you said, I don't, I didn't like the idea that you could go everywhere with little things stopping you and, like, encountering, like, level 60 Pokemon for whatever, you know, and then just not being able to catch them mm-hmm. was, like, the biggest thing for me. I feel like that was, like, a misstep. I feel like you, you definitely should have, they should have segmented the wild area or maybe made two or three smaller ones mm-hmm. that had, you know, that you reached at certain points of the game and had access to, like, tougher Pokemon. Like, maybe the first wild area is just, like, a forest. The second one could be the desert and the third one could be, I don't know, like, the ice one or whatever but i definitely feel like they should they, they should have segmented it because it just feels open for open sake like yeah. i don't feel like it was like there was never a point in that game where i said to myself okay i'm gonna stop here i'm gonna go back to the wild area to catch a pokemon and then go back to this city it was never there i never had that yeah. moment I feel like that there's just a lot of stuff broken with the wild area and also with how big it was. It's just like, Mm -hmm. it's hard to maneuver through all of it. And for me, I just like, I felt like I wanted to experience the routes a little bit more just because Mm -hmm. there's a little bit more diversity, like the Pokemon that were offered and like how the routes looked like too. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just because I was more comfortable in routes that the wild Mm -hmm. area just seemed like just a little bit of a weird horizontal movement that it didn't really feel too much like a step forward completely. It just felt like this weird kind of thing where, Mm -hmm. like, I didn't want to completely dive into just yet. And I feel like Mm -hmm. that it got perfected, or not perfected, it got worked on better in the DLC, which we'll get into. What do you feel, how did you feel about seeing Pokemon? um, That was cool. outside Outside of random encounters. It was cool. But it doesn't show you if they're shiny, which was really annoying. Mm. And uh, I wish it had showed you that like they didn't let's go. Like they had the technology. They could have done it. There's a lot of things mm. that they could have done like Pokemon wise, but they just didn't. But it was nice that it showed you what was available out there. But weren't there mm-hmm. still like some Pokemon that were in the grass that you couldn't see that were still available? I can't remember. There were, yeah, yeah. there were that you could encounter, but there were also overworld Pokemon that you could encounter. Mm-hmm. And I feel like maybe they should have toned down the amount of spawns. Yeah. Because I feel like there were definitely like a lot. I don't know. I, I feel like Let's Go kind of had it down to where like you'd see like a cut, like a handful more so than like the amount that they just throw in your face in Sword and Shield when you're running mm-hmm. through grass. Because like if you imagine going through route, the Route 1 area and there's like. I don't know. I can't remember how many spawns there are, but there are definitely like a lot where you're like zigzagging through because you're just trying to get through. Yeah. You're not trying to encounter every single one of them. Yeah, you can't run through a straight line in those in those routes or wild area, especially the wild area. You can't run through a straight line. Right. And so um, stuff like that. But I did enjoy it for what it was. And I guess we can go ahead and go into the dens because that's where we seem to be chomping at the bit to get at. Yeah. Uh, dens are broken. <laughs> so broken dens are absolutely Jesus. broken it was because so with this bad. generation they introduced the xp candies yeah. which was a generally a way to, for you to like save time from training so let's say you know this just gives you xp they tried to limit it limit it quote unquote where the level of raid was tied to how many badges you had but with no badges and this is not a joke this is actually what, what happened day one when we got sword and shield day one i had a raid where i caught a tramp inch it was it was within the level uh the level cap i could catch it at mm-hmm. 
with no badges, caught it, did a bunch of raids, and I had a level 45 Flygon before I went to the first gym. They really messed it up. And I remember when I got a sword, and you asked me to do a couple raids with you, and I got mm -hmm. all these, like, XB Candy Large and XLs, and mm -hmm. my team was just so freaking broken by the first gym as well. Like, the whole right. game, I was over-leveled by, like, 20 levels at least. It just right. wasn't even a challenge at that point. And it was not, Like, no. they should have severely limited that. Or they at least, like, the type of candies that they gave you, they should have just given you only, like, smalls or extra yes, smalls. Yes, smalls or extra smalls yeah, for sure, something yeah. something just minimal. Like, giving you larges and extra large especially, that's so broken. Mm -hmm. It's so right. bad. And I think, like, the highest level raid, we, and there was no level cap on the Pokemon you could catch in the raid. There were only level mm -hmm. caps on the Pokemon you could catch in the wild area. There was that. It, you would just encounter it, and then it'd say, they'd throw the message up and say, oh, you can't catch this Pokemon because, you know, you don't have enough badges. But that wasn't applicable to the raids. And I don't know why that was the case. Like, they should have just, like, they should have capped you, too. Right. They could have done it, like, within two. So, like, one and two badges, you only encounter uh, one-star raids. Two or three and four, you get two stars. Five and six, three. Uh, seven, four. And then eight, you get the five-star raids. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which I think is, like, kind of like a soft lock. I'm not sure. I do know that Greg, when Greg was playing, he couldn't, he didn't find that many five star raids. But after he beat the game, he was finding five star yeah, raids all the time. Yeah, they definitely uh, locked that. I remember I had some issues with that too when I was playing through Sword for the first time, that mm -hmm. I wasn't finding the dens that I wanted the most until I beat the game, and then like everything started opening up. Right, and I will say like initially on launch, like doing the raids with like friends was cool but there was no incentive to really like go out and do it online with other people but well and also the other thing is that you have to have the hurdles that you have to actually have to pay for online this time with the mm -hmm. nintendo uh switch online switch online account which you know the giver well, we could say that for the topic on itself but you know it, it really limits how many people can get in there and it's, you know, because obviously it's a pay hurdle. But where things really changed and where I think this game makes its mark in people's memories is the event max raids that they have. Yeah. Still going on, actually, to this day. I mean, it's 2022. Yeah. And they're These still games... going through. They came out three years ago. Came almost. out three years ago. And they've just been doing it for all this time where they introduce a select listing of Pokemon and, like, what their chances are at, at what different raids. But they also throw in, like, a chance for a shiny Pokemon. These raids are... Not, some of them are theme specific but most of them kind of feel like they just select them at random Especially but like a uh, lot of like the minor pokemon that are in there that are not the shinies like a right. lot of those ones really seem random but right. uh yeah basically it starts at least for us for pacific standard time usually starts around like like five o'clock p.m pst on a thursday mm -hmm. and then it would end on sunday at five o'clock pst yeah the whole time like you could have a higher chance of finding uh, a certain den with a 2% shiny Pokemon, which we've done a handful of times. We've gotten a lot of shinies from those ones. Mm -hmm. But then there's also just as many times where we didn't find anything. And, like, right. trying to find that specific den that could have the five-star of whatever is also slim in and of itself. I mean, sometimes you could but... jump into somebody else's den online, mm -hmm. which is kind of fun. But... A lot of times when you try and join somebody, they're already filled up because there's other people that are trying to do that too. Because there's so many people. And I feel like that's a statement in itself that, that when they do this stuff, it drives up the player count and drives up yeah. the on the activity for this game so much because, you know, like you said, it's been three years. And every time one of these events rolled around you can and you turn on your online features, you can just see all these people battling in these max rage trying to get that shiny Pokemon mm -hmm. and off and, you know, just like doing them all and stuff like that and i really feel like that is what people are going to remember about this game the most is the uh the max raid mm -hmm. yeah the max raid battles i think that's one of the things i'll remember the most about i think that's the thing right. i'll remember the most about the base game let's say the base game yeah. yeah about the base game the max raid events were easily the most fun thing but even then it also was the most time consuming for the for the payout for the say. payout yeah yeah but yeah i would say it's a fix like the wild area if they had split it up into like three or four areas. Well, here's what I, th what I think is going to happen. I feel like the openness of the wild area, and you can look at it in Legends too, but it's a little bit too big in that one too, because we do have separate wild areas in those, is if they had like taken the concept of the wild area with Pokemon in the wild and encounterable and combined it with routes to in between towns, I feel like that is what was what they're trying to get for in the future of this game. It's it doesn't have to be huge, and I don't want it to look like Let's Go because Let's Go was basically just like doing that, but incorporating the old routes in the game. Just give it like a little bit of openness and a little bit of searching, and have Pokemon be in a specific area that you have to go get, 
and just you know st- if they can incorporate that between towns i feel like that would be a lot better yeah absolutely just like just like this like just like chunks of the wild area placed as the routes where they're way more open and they mm-hmm. i guess they do have the specific biomes but mm-hmm. Like, not as a giant area like this where you have to trudge through the whole place just to get to one area where they could have, like, a specific, like, an ice area or a jungle area, and they have those, like, wide and 3D view, or, like, the 360 view, like, in the wild area, but in mm-hmm. bite-sized pieces. Right. Because what I'm thinking of right now is I'm thinking of, like, high Hyrule Field, the way how, like, in Ocarina of Time, like, how you have the giant Central Plains area, and then you have each, you know, little theme-specific area. You have the volcano which could have fire Pokemon. The central plains mm-hmm. could have like a mixture of like field and forest type Pokemon. Yeah. And then you get to the beach and there's like all water Pokemon and stuff like that. Exactly. I feel like they just need to fo- like focus on the transitioning areas being a little bit open, a little bit exploratory and having those little patches of grass in between and Pokemon is running about, mm-hmm. but not as open as expansive as the wild area is yeah. and how different that is. Mm-hmm. If they had a little, you know, just like building up the amount of Pokemon you can encounter and stuff like that, because like going to whatever and then like having to come back to the wild area to catch a certain pokemon is not like conducive to gameplay it's more mm-hmm. like you're having your player having to take an extra step just to get yeah. their favorite pokemon it's more like a chore it's more like a chore yeah. than it would be like a journey yeah you're only working to achieve this one thing and then when you get it it's done there's no extra reward for doing that what would you give your the rating area? of the routes and wild area or the wild area, man, I, I'd say I'd have to s- separate it. I'd say the wild area and the max rate should be separate. Yeah. Uh, for the wild area, I'd do a 5 out of 10. I feel like yeah. it's a great concept, but it's, it you know, it obviously needed it's, more practice and more... Um, it needs to be polished more. Polished more. But max rates, I feel like as a feature and as a concept and as a lasting thing, I feel like are a 9 out of 10. Yeah, I feel like the wild area, I have to agree with like a 5 out of 10 just because of all of the stuff that they could work on. But with the mm-hmm. max raids and all that, I feel like that the regular raids, I would give like, um, I give it like a, like a 7. Or In like their a current or state, yeah, I'd say yeah. a 7 because but, they do need to be fixed. They do need to the, be limited. And the events, yeah. though, the max rate events after you beat the game, I would give those like an 8 or a 9. Yeah, definitely those are 8 or 9. But as the max rates are in their current state, mm-hmm. I'd say, yeah, 7, out of, seven out or yeah. 8 out of 10. Mm-hmm. Just because they need to be limited as to what you can catch. And what you and could to, gain from it. And what you could gain for doing it. Would because, you? You, like you said, getting the large candies with no badges and, you know, just like over-leveling just your Pokemon. completely yoked by the time you fight Milo so you could finally match his big old Right, and muscles. then you have to go from your starting area to the wild area and then all that stuff in between before your first badge. There's just like so much there. Like, honestly, I'd like if Milo was Pokemon weren't like level 35, that's probably what it should have been with all the stuff that you could do before that, like if you took your starter and used no other Pokemon before that, and mm-hmm. you didn't do any max rate events, I think you would be like level 35 by the time you got to Milo. So Absolutely. I felt like it, the levels should have been more... Yeah, uh, they should have been staggered more, or they should have made it like, if they're really going to try and push that at the beginning of the game, they should really mm-hmm. have made everybody else stronger to, mm-hmm. in relation. But uh, yeah, so overall with the base game, what, what what do you get with base sword and shield you get the gym challenges you get your, your standard journey with your eight gym badges and your starter pokemon you also get the wild area with its access to pokemon and how many pokemon are in the base game like 400 right uh yeah yeah there's 400 in the base game 400 exactly you get your, ba- your base 400 pokemon you get your new pokemon plus your couple of regional forms and then your box legendaries and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And actually, before we get onto that, we'll we'll, we'll get into legendaries in a second. But ba- but basically, with all of the stuff in the base game, what would you give base sword and shield as an overall rating? Base as a, sword po- and as a main as series an overall Pokemon. rating. Yeah, uh, I would give base sword and shield an overall rating of like a probably like a seven, like a, okay, maybe like a six or a seven out of ten. I'm not too far off from that either. I was going to give it a 6 out of 10. Mm-hmm. I would say it, Sword and Shield in its base form would be a 6 out of 10. Yeah. Exactly. I feel like the story and the mechanics really drag it down as an experience overall. I feel like it's not memorable. There's hardly, if any, challenge to the game itself. And like I said, the story falls flat and the characters look great, but they have zero personality. And so not really that many built... characters really get realized. Right, not or many characters that, get realized. Any, except for like Hop is the only one that has the most character development or any character yeah. development for that matter 
I'd say Hop and Sony are the only two yeah. that actually have like overall character development. Yeah. And then we go into we'll, we'll go from there to the box legendaries. Uh, Zayshin and Zamazenta are kind of just like whatever lame. for me. <laughs> lame. lame. They're so I, lame. I honestly enjoy their base forms over their armored forms so much. Yeah, and even their mechan their gimmick, the the freaking armament is just so forgettable. It's so boring. Like. Yeah. They look almost exactly the same and mm -hmm. there's barely any differentiation between them except for one has a one holds a sword in its mouth and the other one has a shield for its mane. Like that's so boring. Mm -hmm. And like, I enjoy their base forms more so than their armored forms. Uh, Zamazent, I feel like it, is, it has the better one in the base form where Zacian's yeah. kind of eh. Yeah. Yeah, Zacian, it's... Ugh, I really don't care for Zacian, honestly. Like, if I had to pick one, it'd easily be Zamazenta. Yeah, Zamazenta definitely has, like, the most, yeah. like, appeal with his bold coloring, whereas Zamazenta's yeah. kind of faded. Yeah. Even the, even the same thing in their armored form. Zacian's kind of just, you know, faded colors, whereas Zamazenta's, like, bright and In bold. your face. In your face. But the thing is, like, Zacian, I prefer Zacian battle-wise because I prefer offensive maneuvers and mm -hmm. defense. But yeah, they're honestly forgettable. They serve very little purpose in the story other than to be, oh, they're the Pokemon to save the day. Mm -hmm. Because up until, like, the very end of the game, they have no relevance on the story. You encounter yeah. them in the beginning of the game. Or mm -hmm. you encounter at least one of them in the beginning yeah. of the game. Then they have no relevance up until the last part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now we need you, and then they show up. And then, obviously, it's had that uh, when people were complaining about Dexit and you know picking apart the game because they're like, oh, we worked on character animations and then they had like the end footage of Zamazenta like being there and then doing a th like a like it didn't move its legs, just did a full 360 mm -hmm. like a like a yeah. model turn and then walked away. I remember that being a thing oh and people my God, being super upset about such that. Such a meme, I love it. They're like, you can't you can't put all the Pokemon in the game, but you said, like, talk about your animations. This thing looked like you grabbed yeah. and clicked it with a mouse and turned yeah. it around. Exactly. It was just such a joke. It looked like something that they could have animated, like, in PowerPoint. Yeah, like, it was, it was, it was terrible. But, yeah, these th these two, you know, they're box legendaries, but they're not, so they're not like, Pokemon that when I put them in my living decks that I'm like, yeah, those two were, yeah. like, memorable catches. Yeah, because even, like, in Gen 7, like, Solgaleo and Lunal were way more distinct than right. Zacian and Zamazenta. This is just like, it seemed like that they copy and pasted the same thing and then just like changed it up slightly. Yeah, it's just very Like lazy. I said, if they, if they had like more like relevance to the story, like, you know, like your family has the rusted sword or whatever, and they talk about this Pokemon like throughout the game and like they talk it up and stuff like that, then yeah, maybe I would have a different opinion on them, but they just show up. <laughs> Let's not talk let them from, we'll move on from these two unforgettable Pokemon to the most forgettable legendary Pokemon of the generation eight. Eternatus. Uh, Eternatus. And Boring. yeah, where the hell did this thing come from? Like, what even is this thing? It's just a bunch of polygons. It's so right? lame. Now, don't get me wrong. This Pokemon had the potential to be like the next Mewtwo. This thing was like a laboratory design Pokemon, like Genesect and mm -hmm. Mewtwo. Maybe there's like some after story where you have to hunt it down and track it and capture it. Maybe I would have it would be a different opinion. But this thing just shows up out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Talk about shoehorned. This is the definition of that, that it's just like, oh yeah, all this stuff is happening all of a sudden. Oh yeah, what is this thing over here? <laughs> it's just What is this thing? And then don't even get me started on its Gigantamax form. <sighs> it's... Yeah, like, what... <laughs> It's a load of nothing. What is this? It's all nothing. It's just a giant hand, and I don't... It has, like, no relevance in, in both design. I, I don't understand it. <laughs> I, I hate it. Like I honest, I can't bring I can't bring up the words to describe like it's to, to indescribably talk about just it. average. It's so mid, and like you said, it had the potential to be great, but it isn't. Right. Not to mention it's a it's a poison dragon, which is a pretty yeah. cool typing. But yeah, it doesn't it look serves, like a poison dragon. It doesn't, but it serves like no purpose. It doesn't look right? like anything to me. Yeah, it just looks like I don't know. It just I feel like this thing, thing. I can't was even, like... was misdesigned or not misdesigned, but misused so much. Yeah. It seems more like an Ultra Beast than it does like uh, an actual. You know, Pokemon. this reminds me of this reminds me of Zygarde. This is a, this is a Zygarde because this thing just comes out of nowhere, serves no purpose, and who knows? Maybe in Gen Nine, it'll get like it'll a new form, realized. like like Zygarde did. Yeah. Yeah, like Zygarde did. Maybe it'll get fully realized in a different game. But that's so stupid. It should be fully realized in the game it's introduced in. It's like they're, right, like, they're, it should they're be. just throwing features on it afterwards. And, oh, you know, Lord. the whole 
story behind it is that it's behind the darkest day which is which was an event in galar pass that caused pokemon to dynamax at random and then these mm-hmm. pokemon went wild and like destroyed you know the surrounding landscape because they're gigantic now and they don't know what to do with themselves which i kind of get but mm-hmm. at the same time, there, there's no explanation as to why that would be bad. I don't know. It, it's it, it, They shoehorned it in to serve some purpose, and I feel like that purpose was not ultimately fulfilled. Yeah, and I can't imagine them wanting to go back to it, but then again, they've surprised us before with, like, Zygarde. Right, this kind of feels like a po- like a th- like like an idea that they had, and they were like, oh, it's so cool, but then, like, years, you know, like, as a kid, they're like, oh my god, this thing is so cool. It's like a T-Rex and shoots lasers mm-hmm. and stuff. And then as they get into, like, adulthood, they're like, oh, my God, like, why did I draw that? It's so cringe. Oh, my God. I feel like they just want to shuffle it under the yeah. the floorboards and yeah. forget about it. But, and honestly, um, I feel like they should. But, yeah, they should. But yeah. if, you know, if, if I could rewind the hands of time and work on it, I would definitely make this thing, like, a Mewtwo and have this be, like, a post-game legendary uh-huh. with, like, uh, Some more Rose... Mystique. Yeah, trying to make like a ultimate Pokemon to, uh, or or try, you know, trying following in Giovanni's footsteps, trying to make like an ultimate Pokemon, or trying to like create the perfect Pokemon or something like that mm-hmm. to do whatever. Because um, we can roll the clock back on this one. I originally when they posed the idea, the gym challenge story to us as the concept, it wasn't like we hadn't had the game yet. I was under the impression that what was gonna happen was you would play through the game and you would using your own skill as a trainer actually make it to the final eight challengers and stuff like that and the gym leaders also would be you know actual trainers stuff like that and that leon would actually be a cheater and that's how he and rose were basically manipulating the league to make it so that leon always came out on top so that they could always stay in power and so like you would start your battle with leon and leon would be like the unassumed like he'd be like a normal person up until it came to where like he would be challenged and then from there he'd become like antagonistic and like dismissive like of bully. you and stuff like that like a bully and then you'd start the battle and then he'd like be like oh like charizard use poison fang or whatever yeah. and then you know like he would do like an animation and then you would all of a sudden would be poisoned because like the field would uh poison you and stuff like that or i felt like that would have been way a way better or like he's allowed like story. more moves like in the same turn yeah. or he has like moves that are like that Charizard couldn't learn. Yeah. And so that, and like you exposing that and beating and doing stuff like that would, you know, ultimately, yeah, like people would be like, oh my God, like what a cheater, blah, blah, blah. But then he could have like this redemption, like, oh, I just wanted to be everybody's favorite. And, you know, mm-hmm. bef- before I was champion, no one even took like a second look at me and stuff like that. But I thought like that would have been way more interesting. Yeah. And that would have added more to Hop's character too, where he's just like, I looked up to my brother yeah. and it turns out he's a cheater. Like, I don't know how I'll be able to like bring back honor to our family's name. And... Right. And same thing with like the other gym leaders. How are they going to react when they realize like, you know, they've been cheated out of a win when yeah. fighting against Leon for, you know, the years that they've been in the league. And then, you know, in your post-game stuff, um, like we said about Eternatus being a like a made Pokemon, we could have like Rose being like, oh, like I made Eternatus to actually like help Leon mm-hmm. to be like a super strong Pokemon so that way he wouldn't actually lose and we had to stop we didn't have to actually cheat. But now it's broke containment and you need to stop it. And so like it like destroying like the tower and stuff like that because it's out of control could have been like a you know like a, a better story than what we got. And you know, going back to what you said about like honor and stuff like that, that would really pump up like the sword and shield aspect and like the royalty aspect of like the british royal family and stuff like that like you know you know stuff about honor and whatnot Mm -hmm. so yeah that was that was my sword and shield pitch but uh going back to eternatus and stuff like that uh design wise i like its base form i think it looks cool and alien i'd give it like a seven out of ten uh i love its typing i love everything about it it's just an uh it's just another zygarde unfortunately that just you know was a pokemon in its game that didn't get utilized but what are your thoughts i would give it like a six and a half to seven out of ten for the base design and then the dynamax i or the gigantamax or whatever form you want to call it i would give it like a three like a two i i I honestly don't even think it's worth rating because yeah. yeah, you don't get it dumb. in the game. You yeah. fight it once and that's it. <laughs> yeah, it just might as well just not exist at this point. Right. Yeah. Might as well just it, not exist. I just don't care for it. Eternatus is lame. Z- Zacian and Zamazenta are lame. Yeah, the legendaries didn't really. Honestly, none of them really, like in general, except for maybe a couple of them in the DLC, were like, wow. But even then, right. the wows were just like, 
Wow. Right. Wow. And then yeah. just as a short aside before we continue forward, um, new Pokemon. Did any new Pokemon that were in this generation stand out to you, or was it all the, was it all the regional forms and the region and the regional evolutions were the ones that stood out to you better? Weighing that on that scale, what, what, what would you say has more been more impactful on you? Regional forms and regional evolutions, or Gen A new Gen A Pokemon? Um. Uh... I would probably say, well, are we including the DLC or just base game? Let's say base game for now. But what stood out to you more? Honestly, I guess the new Pokemon if I had to pick. But, like, honestly, neither of them really stood out to me. Like, mm -hmm. everything was just pretty mid, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I could rant and ramble about some of it. Yeah, they're both just okay at best. What was um, the most memorable new Galar Pokemon that stood out to you? Most memorable new one, I would probably say... Well, at least that I enjoyed the most. I liked using the most was probably... I liked using Centiscorch, honestly. Yeah. Like, I really like Centiscorch. Uh, I liked... Um... Oh, God, I can't even remember. Like, Grimmsnarl was pretty cool. <sighs> but honestly, on that, I can't really think of too many that I cared for. Like, I, I didn't I'm gonna use... I'm going to take it easy out here. Yeah. Uh, I like Toxtricity a lot. Oh, yeah, that one was a fan favorite. I used it mm -hmm. in Shield... And I didn't think too much about it. I thought it was fine. Mm -hmm. But also, it had that one glaring weakness of ground, which was kind of bad. But, mm -hmm. I mean, his design was pretty cool. But Sentus Quartz might be my favorite if I had to pick one that wasn't a starter. Yeah. And then other than that, nothing else stood out to you. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I, I really am chomping at the bit here to get into the regional forms. But... Yeah. Yeah, none of the regular, like, Sword and Shield or Gen 8 Pokemon, like, really stood out to me. There are a couple of favorites, like Applin and the mm -hmm. Choodle, and then Corviknight, obviously, is another big yeah, one. Corviknight was good. Corviknight was uh, really the Imp good. The Imp line, the, and then, you know, more Pico. But other than that, a lot, and Dragapult line, but other than that, a lot of them don't really stand out to yeah, me. It's none like, of them oh really my god. None of them stood yeah, out, honestly. Pokemon. But that's just me, like, just just reaching to think of something that i like and honestly i didn't really care for gen 8 all that much it just was whatever generation but let's move on into the regional forms what's your favorite regional form pokemon base game base game i would probably pick okay i guess oh, do, I... You, do you want to combine regional forms and regional evolutions or have those two be separate let's combine them let's combine them yeah. okay and then in that case my favorite one's mr rhyme mr rhyme yeah the tap dancing <laughs> mr rhyme or he's dancing with his little thing uh for me i i mean i guess the, i mean by, it's not it's not even a contest by just say gallard or manaton yeah by default i i have to go with gallard or manaton like i have to go by default like i gotta support my boy I was just trying to yeah. think if there's anything else that I like more. <laughs> okay, as I say, the ones that like stood out to me that I really enjoyed was definitely the Linoon. Yeah. Um, Galar Linoon, I don't know what it is about it. Even though it's just like a bog standard Mon, its departure from its original design just stood out to me so much. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Galar. Uh, well, Galar Farfetch'd, I don't know why. It's, it's you know, it's what I wanted. It's what, because they I wanted mm -hmm. them to give it a regional form. It's like the regional form where like they changed like the last form, but they don't change the any of the prior forms. Oh, oh, like like the Hisuian ones. Yes, like the Hisuian ones. But like for whatever reason, they've done that for Farfetch'd, but I feel like they didn't go far enough for it. Because yeah, they, what's different it, from it this wasn't thing that, is that far fetched. The... Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> It's it's it just has a bigger leak and it's dark. Yeah. It's just yeah, like I don't yeah. feel like that was much of a departure from what it was before. Yeah, it's it was pretty lame. I do like Galar Weezing because it reminds me of Doug Dimonome. And uh I do have one as a shiny, which I remember calling you because I found a shiny coughing and uh -huh. I knew that the coughing had explosion. So mm -hmm. I was stressing, I was like, Oh god, how am I gonna catch it? What am I gonna do? So I called you, I was like, Bottle, what do I do? What do I do? And I think I ended up deciding that I was gonna use a master ball on a coughing because right. <laughs> like i right. didn't want it to go <laughs> um oh, another one that i really enjoyed uh was runagrigus and gallery yeah. mask yeah runagrigus was really cool yeah there's the right. mask right over there runagrigus was super cool ground ghost i didn't use it but i liked the design but right, I the design was great Grigas either uh and then we got mr mr rhyme and mr, mr. mime mm -hmm. or gallery mr. was cool and its evolution method was very unique yeah, yeah. it's as bad as unique as was, was in k what well, you have to turn the 3ds upside yeah, down yeah you have to physically move your 3ds go upside yeah. down with it they also had a lot of weird ones like rune you have to take a certain amount of damage without fainting mm -hmm. yeah you had to i think you also had to do like some like critical hits with surfetch yeah you had to do three critical hits in a row yeah uh, and then um another one that was kind of like sleeping that i really enjoyed even though i didn't mm -hmm. get it and use it was the cursola and galarian corsola yeah i like their designs and i like the like the theme around it as morbid as it is 
but mm-hmm. I didn't definitely use it. morbid. Yeah, it was so morbid, and it was weird that it was only Ghost that it wasn't like Ghost Rock. Yeah, I feel like that it could have benefited from Ghost Rock. Has there been a Ghost Rock type? I can't remember. Uh, Off the top of my head, I can't think of anything. Interesting. Yeah, they could have done Rock Ghost to make the first Rock Ghost type, but nope. But yeah, so overall, I'd say I enjoyed the regional forms and evolutions more so than I did yeah, um, totally. Pokemon that, came, that they came out in this generation. I with. agree. I mean, they're definitely a few strong contenders from both sides, like Corviknight, Dragapult, mm-hmm. Grimmsnarl, the Hatcherina line, yeah. Choodle, and the Applin line. I mean, mm-hmm. there are a couple, but like I feel like it's more in favor of the regional forms even though yeah. there's like a handful of them they, i feel like they the quality is way more the quality is way more yeah and so moving on from and so now your overall i think we said it before but overall score for sword and shield combined base sword and shield i would say like a six like a five six, or six. five or six yeah. out of ten yeah yeah i'm with you i'm uh, probably leaning more towards a six mm-hmm. Just, i feel like there, there's a lot of stuff a that, lot of stuff that they could have that they could have worked on more but then they ended up doing later on a lot of yeah it's just a lot of wasted potential in in general yeah, a lot of stuff eight. that brings it down ultimately six out of ten mm-hmm. but you know lo and behold a year later that came out of left field that lifted this game from unobscurity into relevance again was the Pokemon Sword and the Shield expansion, expansion pass. pass. Yes. And honestly, I very much, like, I'm of the mindset where DLC shouldn't be... Like, with games these days, I, it's like a thousand-piece puzzle where they give you 750 of the pieces, and then you gotta buy the 250 pieces afterwards. It should <sighs> be that they give you, like, the whole thing, and then everything else is just, like, extra to it. Where it's like, it's like the cherry on top of the sundae. Right. And I feel like... That with Breath of the Wild, for example, they did that perfectly where the DLC was like the cherry on the perfect Sunday. But mm-hmm. with Sword and Shield, I kind of feel like it's almost like a mix of both where it's like the game itself is fine, but this just adds like the whipped cream. It adds the cherry. It adds the sprinkles. This is so much better than the actual base game. And I feel like the, to experience the best of Sword and Shield, you have to get the expansion pass. And I feel like it's important that we zoom in on what you said before. It adds stuff that goes in there where it really... Um, well, I'd say for at least the Isle of Armor is very... It's it's not, like, needed, but the stuff that it does add is definitely needed. So mm-hmm. let's start with what, what you get with the Expansion Pass. With the Expansion Pass, you get both DLCs, the Isle of Armor and the Crown Tundra. And what do those two add? They add Pokemon. Both of them add Pokemon to mm-hmm. the game. Some of them are exclusive to it. Were the Isle of Armor, you get Kubfu and Urshifu, and then the Crown Tundra, you get Calyrex, his his mount, either um, Spectrier or Glastrier, Spectrier and then you also or get Glastrier. Uh, Regieleki, Regi Drago, either or. Mm-hmm. And then you also get access to the Galarian birds, which we will get to later. I think we might uh, top that end our end our podcast on that today but um all but all the regular pokemon that get added to um are tradable to the base sword and shield game without having to own the dlc Mm -hmm. so if you had the expansion passing for whatever or you or you had base sword and shield for whatever reason you refused to buy the dlc on principle you could get but you had a friend you had a friend that still had it you could transfer you could trade those pokemon still Mm -hmm. you weren't completely locked out of getting them yeah which i thought was pretty cool but Mm -hmm. Also, it was just so good that there's like, like, what's the point of just doing Sword and Shield without the expansion pass at this point? So, yeah. So let's go ahead and dive into what the first DLC, the Isle of Armor, Mm -hmm. and what first got uh, introduced was Galarian Slowpoke. There he is right there on the picture. Beautiful. Laying on the floor. A little good boy. And his evolution, uh, Galarian Slowbro. Yes. Which are definitely two of my favorite uh, Galarian forms. I would say probably my favorite Galarian form to come out of Gen 8 aside from the uh, birds both slowpoke and slowbro but then you, you know you got that and then they introduced the uh, story aspect and a uh, exclusive legendary to the isle of armor in um Kubfu. Yes. and so do you, what the isle of armor adds is definitely added like over i think it was 200 pokemon it added uh, added to... 100 in Isle of Armor, then 100 in... Uh, oh, okay, so it's 200 in both. Yeah. So I added 100 in both. And it definitely added, like, some fan favorites. And obviously we're missing because of Dexit and stuff like that. So it definitely added, like, a plethora of new Pokemon to catch. Because let's say that you played Sword of Shield and you completed the Pokedex and you got that. Now you have to go to the Isle of Armor and catch all the new Pokemon that are there. Or new 
Pokemon that you couldn't catch before and then add them to your Pokedex and, you know, basically go through it all again. And then you got your reward for that, which was the uh, crown. Scraggy. Scraggy as well, yes. And Scraggy was a reward. Bunky was a reward, too. And so, um, yeah, you actually got, there was also the additional challenge. That, so even if you didn't want to play for, like, the story that they had with it, you could just play just to get your, um, mm-hmm. your Pokedex filled out. But it did add a little bit of story with a couple of other memorable characters with designs. Basically, the two version exclusive ones, but being Clara and Avery, which I believe were both what psychic and poison to coincide with uh slowpoke and slowbro yep. and then they also added the master of the dojo the of the person who lives on the island uh master mustard yeah but... and the mistress with the thickness honey 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 who also had a little secret but uh yeah you did uh you did you went through like a little journey with you and your cub fu and you know getting that and then you had ultimately the choice of turning it into the single strike and rapid strike yeah form. single and rapid strike and they both had separate typings one being fighting, fighting dark. water and fighting dark yeah and so ultimately you did the, this was a neat little dlc you got you got your new pokemon you got your little short story adventure you got access to a bunch of more uh characters uh, another thing that they added was this one was the uh, Cramomatic, which was a way to, you know, manipulate certain items to get other items Mm -hmm. so you could get access to like more trs and tms oh that's another thing we didn't talk about but uh trs and tms Mm -hmm. and the difference between those so trs were breakable but they had like the better moves and tms were just the reusable ones and stuff like that i never used a tm i only use trs you only use trs yeah Yeah. so then you could get those but then they also brought back the um the apricorn balls but those were almost impossible to get because of just the the chance that they had on the cramomatic and i don't know why they were so hard to get it's not like they're broken yeah, you definitely got a lot in a, such a small package. I feel like the Crown Tundra on its own was definitely worth it. Well, I don't think it was. I would say it was worth it. Mm-hmm. I would say on its own, the Crown yeah. Tundra was worth it to get yeah. as an Isle addition to Armor Sword Shield. Was, I feel like Isle of Armor was like fine. Crown Tundra, I feel like, was the like the everything in the DLC. Was everything the expansion else. Pass. The Crown Tundra is like necessary. I feel like they could have added a little more to the Isle of Armor. Mm-hmm. But I definitely would yeah. have appreciated if they like had flooded the, the island with trainers. Yeah, that would have been good instead of it just Maybe it could have been like, uh, you know, they have like students in Mustard's Dojo, like the, but you never actually battle them other than yeah. the, the main one being either Clara or Avery. But I would have appreciated it if there were like other people visiting the island. Maybe there was a town on the island and, and you know, kind of like an area. Yeah. And maybe if they had like some sort of, some other gimmick to coincide with the story there. Some something sort of else. Like battle Dojo. Yeah, something else to coincide with that. And I mean, they do have that. You can do like a challenge in the Dojo, but I don't, you know, I feel like if they had like another city and definitely if there were trainers on the island especially if they were like rebattable trainers you could have got more from that but ultimately what you get from this is 100 pokemon your urshifu or kubfu if you want to keep it that way and then access to galar slowpoke and galar slowbro yes which is really the selling point of isle of armor is the galar slowpoke and slowbro as well and urshifu and kubfu <laughs> And then that's... no no it's all about the slow poke and the slow bro and then you also have the um the secret uh donating watts to honey which yeah. like some people had to grind i know i had to grind out a lot of raids for those i think you actually yeah. had to give her like three million yeah it's just some some absurd amount for and then honey. you get to, uh you get to battle honey and then you also get her trainer card which is another thing we were about to mention uh trainer cards yeah which i never cared for like you just kind of no? yeah, I didn't care for it. I thought it was. You didn't care for yours or other any people of it. or the character any of stuff. It. I no? made my character look like Marnie at the end of it. I was just like, whatever, I'm good. I think like the cards were like a remnant of what we were talking about of like doubling down on the gym trainer story mm-hmm. and adding more stuff to because you had your like their base card and then you could get like their secret card yeah. at a later at a later yeah, date. Yeah, the secret cards were kind of more interesting just because you really had to work for them. So yeah, overall, what would you give the Isle of Armor? Isle of Armor, I would give like a I would give like a seven or eight. I would say an eight. I yeah. think the Pokemon that they introduced were great. I mean, you have to buy it in order to get the Urshi the Kafu and Urshi so it's not like that great but i feel like they're, they, they it was a good pokemon overall and then just like i said on top of all the other pokemon they added that you could get to make your game more fun plus you can access it right away as, as soon as you get the yeah. so they made it if you started a new game you can go to the isle of armor right away and it's not like level i don't think it's level locked like the wild area is and it's like um it's set to your level so if you run through the game and you have like a level 14 starter you'll encounter like level 14 pokemon on the on the i didn't know that that's cool area yeah i knew yeah. you could access it but i didn't realize i guess i didn't process in my head that the pokemon would be level adjacent i'm not sure that's all there i might have to do a little bit of research on that but i do remember going there and getting like encountering like a level 14 abra mm-hmm. 
Uh, and now we move on to the creme de la creme. The crown the, tundra. The crown tundra. Yeah, our... And really, this is the DLC you do need to get, re- regardless of whether if I don't it's... think you can if you can buy them separately no, anymore. You can't. You're not allowed. You've never not been allowed able to, to anymore. Never been able. Never to. been able to. Never been able. Okay. To. Well, um, yeah. If if they were separate and you had to pick, this would be the one you should it, buy. Everything is about the Crown Tundra. It seems like. At least all right. the best stuff I feel like was in Crown Tundra, or the most replayability is in it. They added a story that has to do with the uh, Pokemon you see there, the Calyrex, which was mm-hmm. interesting. wasn't yeah. like you know the most interesting I've seen in a while, but it was definitely different and you know not memorable but notable. Like you can make like a little note of it, like oh that was cool. You got access to not only Calyrex but also to Glastrier, Glastrier and, and Spectrier, Spectrier as Pokemon, which are pretty cool. And then you get the fusion gimmick between the both of them and have him ride on his noble steed and so that was cool but they also added two new reggies which kind of threw people for a loop as to like you know yeah. like oh like why why were they hidden there as opposed to hoen you know what's the story behind them and reggie gigas which ultimately we didn't get they just threw reggie gigas in there but we uh, you know we got access to um, reggie draco and reggie Yeah, and as well as the other three reggies as well mm-hmm. which reggie did you prefer out of the two reggie Lecky, reggie draco Honestly, they're both like a toss up for me, but if I had to pick, I'd say Reggie Lucky. Yeah, I honestly like Reggie Drago more. Yeah, I don't know. I like that big old like Charizard head it has for its arm. I thought that was mm-hmm. super cool. Just its color scheme is awesome. I love Reggie Alecki, but Reggie Drago just took it for me. Right, but it was also like the legendary. I would say if I had to rename this DLC, I'd say the legendary update because they yeah. added all the legendaries from every game back into this one, bar mm-hmm. the mythicals. So they added the the Canto birds. They added the legendary dogs, So Lugia, the Weather Trio, Latios, Latias, all of Sinnoh's legendaries, mm-hmm. and then um, all twenty million of them. All of you, you know, uh, Reshiram. Zekrom. Literally, they added every single legendary in the game. But they also added it in the new mode that plays off of the max raid mechanic, which is the Dynamax Adventures. Yes. So, with the Dynamax Adventures, you select a free listed Pokemon out of, like, a random three, and you go Mm -hmm. on an expedition with three other players, whether you're friends online or just random NPCs, and you go through all these battles in, like, a labyrinth kind of thing. You could pick up some items here and there to help you on the way, but at the end, you battle a random legendary. Uh, You don't know who it is until you get there, unless if you have one, like, saved in your list, which you could save up the three of them. It does give you its type as well. Yeah. It gives you a basic type, so you can kind of, like, strategize as you get over there. You get, like, three or four battles before you get to the legendary. And at the end of it, everything that you've caught, which is 100% capture, it has a possibility of being a shiny. They all have a 1 in 100 chance after you get shiny charm. Right, yeah, after getting yeah. the there shiny are charm. There are different uh, levels to whether it could yeah. be shiny, but basically it was yeah. very a very easy way to get a shiny Pokemon. Yeah. And also very easy ways of getting shiny legendaries. And so you don't have to take the legendary or any of the Pokemon if you don't want it. You could just say, I don't want them. And then it could re-roll the shinies on there. Right. So Which wasn't you... really explained to you yeah. in, in the, doing it because that also has a little story with it. But uh, yeah, so you had the access to get shiny legendaries, which was also great. But I just feel like the Dynamax Adventure mechanic was such a great idea and such a great use of Dynamax Pokemon that Mm -hmm. I kind of want it to come back in Gen 9. I just don't know if, like, how they would bend the Dynamax adventure. Yeah, they'd have to work it something where it's, like, kind of related, but not. They have to have, like, the basic kind of, like, core mechanics of the Dynamax adventures or where you go through, like, an elaborate kind of thing. But Mm -hmm. I don't know how they would fully implement it. But I really want something like that to come back because it really added a lot to multiplayer replayability. Yeah, it definitely added a lot. It definitely reinvigorated, like, playing with your friends Pokemon-wise. Because other than that, you really just were like, hey, can you trade with me? So they really brought that. It really brought that aspect back to Pokemon, which I feel like I've been missing for the series for a while. You know, part of me is sad because I realized, like, you know, it probably won't come back. And I'm just gonna be like, man, like, God, like, what would like? It would be so cool to see like new Pokemon and new chat, new like tweaks to it. It's kind of like the Battle Frontier, which was like, oh man, it's great, but then it's never seen again. And you imagine like what tweaks they could have done to it to make it better. And ultimately, you just know they're gonna abandon it. <laughs> I I like some things to happen, or like for some some of these gimmicks to kind of stay, like Mega Evolutions. 
But then uh-huh. you start to realize they're never going to keep them and they're never going to bring him back. So you kind of just have to like live in the moment. Yeah. Enjoy you, enjoy what you have while you have it. That's uh that's really a, a lesson for life too. Yeah, life lessons. And then <laughs> um yeah, you have them picked up right there, but they also had the uh what are they called? The Swords of Justice? Yeah, the Swords of Justice. And the they had Just- Keldio available too. Yeah, and then they have Keldio and Keldio is actually like one of those like uh, like we were talking about before, Mythicals. one of those legendaries, well, mythical or whatever, yeah. but you had to uh, perform certain tasks in order to get it that weren't like explained to you yeah and that was cool too because it made you think or you had to like talk to friends or like actually use a strategy guide which or, yeah, isn't or common. Go on the internet yeah it isn't common with games these days where it's like there's those like playground rumor kind of things where it's like oh yeah you have to do all this and you have to cook all this food and oh yeah that was the thing that we didn't mention either is the curry picking camp and we didn't talk about but it's yeah, whatever. whatever yeah Nobody cares. <laughs> Just watch, uh, we're going to have... I enjoyed the I cooking. Curry, the curry. I mastered the uh, curry decks. Did you decks. get a golden curry decks? Yeah. yeah. I only cooked curry out of necessity to get Keldeo. I did not use the curry decks. Biggest thing the Crown Tundra added that really... It, it was one of two ways. Either you hated it or you loved it. And I, uh, you seeing them, I can't imagine people who've like hated it. I mean, I could understand, but I, I couldn't be like, oh, I, yeah, I 100% agree. Like, I hate them. Yeah. Was the Galar birds. The Galar birds were 10 out of 10. Yeah. I enjoyed this so much. Incredible. I love them so much. I, I was just like, it was it was that breath of fresh air to Pokemon that I didn't think I needed until I got it. Yeah. And so when they revealed the Articuno Zapdos Small Trace would be getting regional forms, it just it was, I was like such a stunned. And then when yeah. I actually got to like see them in the game, yeah, I was like, oh my god, like these are so cool. Yeah. And they have the rock, paper, scissors typing again as well with a psychic fighting dark that right. they do with like like the starters where it's grass, water, fire. And, right. and they don't share that with their regular counterparts. Mm-hmm. Also, their shiny forms are the original color scheme from their Cantonian forms. It's just a really cool throwback. Like everything about the birds from their designs to their to like the way that you get them. Everything is just so cool and unique. And right. I love it. I love every single one of them. But what's your favorite out of the three? Because mine, uh, I think I... That's always the question that comes up is like, what's your favorite? And I always feel like it's always changing. Mine is Moltres, always. Moltres, yeah. always. I, it's a toss-up between Moltres and Zapdos for me. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I know he kind of is like the Roadrunner, but that, yeah. I feel like that's the appeal to me. So I'd have to yeah. say Zapdos more. Yeah, for me, it's like it's Moltres, then Articuno, then Zapdos. I guess I don't really care too much for the for the Roadrunner thing. But that's mm-hmm. for the for the Galar ones. For Cantonian, it's Articuno, then uh, Zapdos and Moltres. Mm-hmm. So I like really Zapdos feel like Moltres' like... design is like so much better than its Cantonian one. Yeah, it's way better than the Cantonian. Like they kept this motif of fire, but they just replaced mm-hmm. it with dark. Yeah, just like like a demon blaze. Right. I really wish they had just a little bit more of like inkling in the story because really they're kind of just there. They don't mm-hmm. really explain why they're there or you know what relevance they have there but you know at least there. we got at least we got them and they're not like you know shelved somewhere in a filing cabinet that they labeled for later tried use. to take a chance with it and succeed right i feel like their stats too are also really good is there anything else we need to mention about the crown tundra i mean they had like the story aspect with like calyrex and like peony and peonia yeah. and then sonia was there she just happened to be there and then i feel like the area itself didn't really add much to it they just added the pokemon in the yeah. back although i did like, like the area more than the other two like the base game or i of armor up. yeah they like they ha- like the only areas i could like remember of like are where the chambers are for the reggies yeah that big tall mountain that yeah, has the mountain the, was the cool. tree and then that's about it everywhere yeah. else is kind of just like whatever oh the big tree as well yeah the tree was an area i didn't care for it too much but i really like the mountain like the going up the mountain to where calyrex is yeah overall i would have to give the crown tundra like i give it like a nine to a ten like, yeah for just... sure for what it adds in in the dynamax adventures as well mm-hmm. as the amount of legendaries yeah. plus the other po- the i think it added what more fossil pokemon so it added like i think it also added zubat and the mm-hmm. rest i would say yeah if you like i said if you had a pick you gotta you gotta buy the crown tundra not mm-hmm. like you can but if you had if you could the crown tundra was a, is an absolute yeah. must yeah absolutely and if you don't have it and you've been playing sword and shield base then there's something wrong with you there's something wrong with you and you need yeah. to buy you need to yeah. buy the crown Tundra buy now. the game consume but overall, more product what would you say combined with the dlcs does that sh- does that alter your score it of base does. Of the sword and shield experience it does it brings it to like a seven and a half out of ten for me honestly like if it was just crown tundra i'd be cool with that as like like a one-off little like spin-off game i'd stick to seven out of ten i don't yeah. i th- with it they add a lot but i don't think that changes the fact that the core game itself is the not that is, great yeah the core game is boring but the dynamax adventures was just so good like everything about uh, but yeah sword and shield overall 
uh, with all DLCs and everything taken into account, all mechanics, all story stuff, and all the legendaries, I'd say, yeah, overall, it's a 7 out of 10. And really, it was, I, I'd say, you know, if we had everything out of the gate, it would have been a great sign for Gen 8 overall. Mm-hmm. But, you know, obviously, we got the game, and then we got the DLCs, you know, here and there. I think we did get all DLCs before we got any other Gen- Generation 8 games, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, because they didn't announce BDSP or Legends until after that. Until after those yeah. Yeah. Came out, so yeah. yeah, and they had enough time to breathe. Yeah, I think that really dominated um, most of the Pokemon news after mm-hmm. Sword and Shield had come out was the DLCs. Yeah, and I think I remember like a big th- a big thing was that people were talking about like a third or a fourth DLC, like Pokemon... it was gonna come in like waves. Oh, uh, I was I was thinking about Pokemon Gun. Pokemon Gun. Pokemon yeah. Gun. That was that was do the game that think, people were um, wanting. <laughs> do you think they should have added another two DLCs to no. uh, Sword and Shield? No. Do you think that would have changed anything? That would have added overbloated the, rest of the, the game. It would have overbloated everything. And really? I feel like it would have been too much for people to handle, and it wouldn't give enough spotlight to Isle of Armor and Count Tundra. I don't think that they should have added anything else. I think, honestly, for what for the enough promotion and time that, they've, that we've had with Sword and Shield, I think that what they've done was enough. Just the two? Yeah. Yeah, I don't uh, think that there's anything else that's needed. How do you that feel? Put, part of me wanted some more DLC just so that we could have like more time with Sword and Shield, so that way the longevity mm. of the game could be longer, and yeah. we could get event. We could eventually get to the point where all the Pokemon were in Generation Eight before we moved on to Generation Nine. Mm-hmm. But I feel like with what's happened so far with Generation Eight and moving on to Generation Nine, I feel like I don't know how the extra DLC would have, uh, if it would have added or detracted to I the think overall. It would have detracted. Honestly, I can't imagine that they would have found more things to be innovated of that wouldn't be considered for like Generation 9 because they still have Mm -hmm. to keep ideas for other games. And also like the sales at some point are just going to stagnate and just like fall off. So they have to introduce something new. Like, they can't just mm-hmm. stay on the one game forever. It's not like it's World of Warcraft or something. I don't know. I feel like maybe another expansion pass would have been cool, but I can't imagine, like, what that would have been or what that would have added. I would have preferred getting the games that we got in Generation 8 yeah. if I had to sacrifice that for more DLC for Sword and Shield. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, Sword and Shield is a tale of just meh. Yeah, it's a tale of mid. Even with, like, the highest of highs that, that you get from some of the stuff... It's just it, like, overall everything else just brings it down. I mean, it's a way to get the like Pokemon really brought into the next generation, like on the Switch, like new consoles. I don't know. I feel like that Scarlet and Violet is gonna be better overall. Like the base game is gonna be better than Sword and Shield, but right. that's it was, be... it was a hurdle we had to get through to get to where we are now. Yeah. So as much as as much as it was a meh, it was a necessary. Yeah, it's a lot of trial and error. Yeah. But I think that's gonna wrap it up for today. So, uh, Sword and Shield, the story of meh. Yes. Episode episode two, Pokemon Babblers. That TLDR yes. version. So if you want to skip to the end here, just click mid. and is just all right, here are opinion. One word. Mid. <laughs> yeah. Mid. So to anybody that watched the first episode of Babblers or stuck all the way out to this, thank you. Like this is more mm-hmm. views than we've had on most of the videos on the channel so far. So I appreciate that. I don't know if that's relevant to it being like current information for the first episode, but I'm hoping that this one, like enough people support it enough too, because I really like uh, making these episodes. I feel like that the podcast is really fun to just have discussions yeah. and open it up to people. Yeah. So if you like what you saw, go ahead and subscribe. Uh, also, if you want to check us out on Twitch, the links will be down below, but at twitch.tv slash Shaheener and twitch.tv slash Bonder916. Mm-hmm. And if you guys want this on other platforms, like on Spotify or whatever places that you listen to your podcast, let us know and I'll see if we get accommodate if we get enough people asking for it Mm -hmm. but yeah until then this has been your hosts shaheener and bono 916 bye next episode bdsp next episode